All right, so our speaker today is Dr. Michael S. French, who is an ethical culture leader and an active member of the National Leaders Council of the American Ethical Union. He served as leader of the Baltimore Ethical Society from 1975 to 1984, and is currently affiliate minister at the First Unitarian Church in Baltimore. A historian by training, Mike spent most of his career working in health policy for the Maryland Medicaid program. He is now a retired old guy, his own description, uh, enjoying playing his concertina, singing, and now in the waning days of the pandemic, getting back to English country dancing. And uh, just to that note, uh, one of trip, Mike's trips here in the past was uh, when he was able to do calling for country dancing here in this very room on a Saturday night before speaking the next day. Uh, we weren't able to quite pull that together this year, uh, but maybe next time. We'll see. Mike's topic today is radical respect in a time of fractured discourse, what ethical culture offers in our troubled time. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. And it was great to be together singing with you this morning. I just love to do that. It's been, I've really missed this. And you guys are good singers. You know, not every congregation uh, uh, can work that out. Very well. Well, I should, in, in an address in the New York Society for Ethical Culture in 2019, a guy named Howard Radist, I'm about to quote, and I realized I should probably say, you know, not everybody knows anymore who Howard Radist was. Uh, Howard was, is, was an ethical culture leader uh, at the Bergen Society for many years, and then executive, Bart, one of Bart's predecessors as executive director of the American Ethical Union. Uh, he was the headmaster of the fields and school, did all sorts of the great stuff. Uh, in any event, uh, in this talk, in this address he gave in, in 2009, it was called, Must Humanists Be Polite? And he concluded that it was essential. Indeed, if one held humanist values, it was the only way, not only the only effective way, but the only way to engage in discourse. American political and social life has become even more frayed and nasty since those days of uh, when, when, Ray, uh, when Ray just spoke. But I believe his message, which is the message of ethical culture, uh, holds, holds true. Ethical culture offers a useful guide and how to successfully navigate this fractured divide, the divides we have in American society. And we certainly have a divided culture, and I don't need to spend time this morning uh, giving examples. You can just look at your newspaper or look whatever, uh, however you get news. But I do need to clarify what I'm talking about at the onset. I'm not talking about the possibility of having respectful conversations with provocateurs or professional proponents of division, uh, the ranters, uh, you know, these are people that we're not going to, to get anywhere with. But I believe that there are people, let's just call them the other side, for a shorthand here, the, who are on the other side on various issues, uh, even some people who are yelling that we can talk to, that we won't always be successful. Perhaps we will seldom be successful. But I believe that we have to try. And trying means that we might sometimes need to modify our own behavior. Here's a good example of a bad example, the, the, you know, which is the wrong way to address divisive issues. I'm quoting myself here. Uh, from what was, I think, otherwise a pretty good talk that I gave to the Washington Ethical Society back in November. Uh, but I was talking about new ways to look at American history. You know, we've, 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 we've now look at our legacy of racism. Uh, we, we look at the various uh, uh, ways that, you know, American history isn't all good. And we're now looking at that and we can teach that. and. There's been some resistance to this, this way of looking at American history. And here's what I said. As you 
unfortunately don't need to imagine, this new truth arouses people who cannot accept this new view of our country and perhaps of themselves that it creates. Uh, and it creates a new cause for grievance. Hence, the entirely manufactured controversy over critical race theory. CRT is a convenient handle for those who want to deny history." Close quote. Now, here's what I did wrong in that. I dumped all of the controversy into the entirely manufactured controversy category. That forecloses discussion of whatever concern people might have, legitimate or otherwise. Some of this concern is manufactured, but frankly, I can't say that everything that's being taught today uh, about American racial history is, uh, is age appropriate or accurate or is, you know, even good teaching. And the same is true for uh, age appropriate sex education. And which I know some of this current concern about that is uh, just an excuse for anti-gay attitudes, but is all of it? And even if these objections are largely based on racism and anti-LGBTQ attitudes, uh, is dismissing this, these attitudes, <clears throat> and by implication, dismissing the people who hold these attitudes, the best way to change the attitudes and to change the people who hold these attitudes? I think not. I think that's not the best way. Dismissing these attitudes certainly didn't work out for Terry McAuliffe, the former governor and losing candidate uh, in the Virginia race for governor in 2021. He dismissed the parents who, who were raising concern about what they called critical race theory uh, by basically saying it's none of their business. You know, it's all leave it up to the teachers, leave it up to the educators. Now, as someone who has been an educator myself, uh, part of me says, yeah, right on, that's right, we'll leave it up to the educators. But, but that wasn't a good response, either politically or ethically. What are the components of the opposition? Some is racist, and, uh, but what are the origins of that racism? Some, I'm sure, is due to just people's view of American history that they received when they were in school. And a lot of us, you know, were taught bad history. It wasn't our fault, that's what the schools were teaching. Um, and, uh, you know, gone with the wind has been a terrible, terrible uh, 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 contributor to a false view of American history. Oh, and uh, speaking with this is, you know, for this society, your early leader, uh, David Saville Muzzy of Columbia University was uh, one of the, was a very good historian, but a proponent of a view of American history to, today we recognize as, as racist. Um, so, you know, there's just all sorts of stuff going on. And certainly, as we've seen, by dismissing parental concerns, especially in the face of orchestrated attacks, uh, is a failing tactic. We need to take seriously parental concern, even concern that we think is inappropriate, uh, even concern that, you know, is just, we think is just baseless, but we've got to meet the parents where they are. And meeting them includes listening to them. Now, obviously, what I'm, I'm talking about here has implications for the politics and the cultural war that's, that's going on all around us. This is, there's, this is a contest about values that I am deeply invested in. I really want my view to prevail. So I want to be effective in the public sphere, but I also want, in the process of being effective, I want to be the best kind of person I can be. That's the one thing I control. I can't control people who may be yelling and screaming at me. Uh, I can't control what they're saying, but I can control what I say and how I behave and how I present myself. And that, friends, is where ethical culture comes in. So let's take a minute here to do a little ethical culture 101. 
or ethical humanism, if you prefer. That means going back to Felix Adler, who founded ethical culture, and I'll say right off, I'm, I, I'm citing Adler here today, and I cite him a lot, not simply because he founded the ethical culture movement, and, and, and certainly not because sometimes his language is really creaky by today's standards, but because I believe his suggestions offer, his thinking offers useful guidance to us today on how to lead good and effective lives. So there are two points here that guide our participation in this fractured discourse. First, Adler attributed worth to every human being. Everyone is a creature of worth and dignity. We sense this in ourselves, that we are such people, and, and we attribute it to others. We might not be able to see it in others. Others might not exhibit any worth whatsoever, but we attribute it to them. And unless we're willing to do this, unless we're willing to make this attribution, we stunt our own growth. We stunt our own development. This is particularly important because we live in community where each affects the other. And this, parenthetically, this is a topic for another time, but I think ethical culture has been ahead of many other groups in resolving this individual group kind of issue. And, uh, some people see a conflict between individual and, and community. Ethical culture sees no, There's, they're both interrelated, they're both connected, they're both part of the same thing. So that's the first thing. Everybody's a, a person of worth and we have to treat them as a person of worth. Second, the ethical life is about behavior. I mean, not just about what's in our head, but what we do in our lives. Uh, both in what we today call social action and also in interpersonal individual to individual relations. And Adler boiled this down to a simple rule, which he called his supreme ethical rule. Act so as elicit the best in others and thereby in yourself. And you've probably heard it a zillion times. I know I often, uh, it's a centerpiece of what I do. In fact, there's the, uh, the Northern Virginia Ethical Society in this table that they have with their lectern is on, they have a kind of a, a, a cloth there where someone is needle pointed or whatever that's saying, act so as to elicit the best in others and thereby in yourself. Uh, I think this is ethical culture's great contribution to the continuing, you know, the continuing conversation we are having uh, in American society. Uh, and it all boils down to, you know, you can boil this down to just treat everybody with respect. If you attribute worth to an individual, you must respect them. While I might not respect their ideas, I have to respect the people who hold them. That respect, you know, respect them as persons of worth and dignity who deserve my respect and care. I will still try to show them ways of looking at the world that are different from their own because that's part of respecting them, to take them seriously and not dismissing them as I did earlier in my that address that I quoted. Uh, and I'll still oppose their ideas in the political world. I think the path to respect not only makes us better people, but will enable us to make the world a better place. In fact, I've been thinking about this, uh, it's not only respect, but what I'm, I'm calling radical respect. That is deep, fundamental, even sometimes painful respect for the other. So now let's take this discussion, grounded in ethical culture, to the larger community. And the discussions we need to have with folks who might be on the other side of various issues. How do we approach these, these discussions? Radis called it politeness, but civility seems to be the word that we're, we're using today. And I'm going to talk about civility and its cousins, humility and empathy, because I think these are the three legs, if you were on the stool of uh, respectful discourse. 
These are useful tools in our personal lives, but also in our nation's fractured and contentious political life. And they are just deeply rooted in the principles I've been talking about. Now first, civility. Now I'm aware that civility has been sometimes used, you know, critiqued as a, a tool of the status quo. Uh, Saul Alinsky, the community organizer who was so successful, uh, you know, he did a lot of uncivil things to, to, to get things changed. Um, and there's a recently published book called Against Civility, the hidden racism in our oppression with, oh, I'm sorry, the hidden racism in our obsession with civility. And I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, <clears throat> but I think what we're, uh, you know, what we're calling civility here is, is fundamentally and profoundly ethical. Uh, the late Johns Hopkins professor, P.F. Forney, who wrote two very popular books about civility, makes this connection. In his first book, it's called Choosing Civility, 25 Rules of Considerate Conduct. He writes that civility belongs in the domain of ethics. You know, he, he writes, courtesy, politeness, manners, and civilities are all in essence forms of awareness. Being civil means being constantly aware of others and weaving restraint, respect, and consideration into the very fabric of this awareness. That's the individual part of it. And then Professor Forney goes on, civility is not just an attitude of benevolent and thoughtful relating to other individuals. It often entails an active interest in the well-being of our communities and even the concern for the health of the planet on which we live. You know, civility is not just, I'm being polite to you folks, but I, I care about our world and I care about our society. This last point that civility entails an active interest in the well-being of our communities is also stressed by, that's okay, I did that in the middle of a concert the other night. Yeah. I thought I was putting it on mute and I was putting it on ring. Uh, that uh, um, uh, Stephen Carter, who is a professor of, of, of law at Yale, and he has a book called Civility, Manners, Morals, and Etiquette of Democracy. And he writes, civility, and these are my words here, I'm paraphrasing, civility isn't just about being nice. You know, civility, he, he, his rules for civility include this. Religions do their greatest service to civility when they preach not only love of neighbor, but resistance to wrong. A civil person, according to Professor Carter, is a respecter of persons, but would not be namby-pamby, would not be afraid to make waves. So civility is about speaking out. It's not just about you know, how we speak to, each, uh, to others. To be civil is also about how we listen to others. You know, we have to recognize the people who have been excluded from the conversation might not enter the conversation with the degree of politeness that we would want or that some of us who've been, you know, have not experienced the oppressions of society uh, uh, are used to expressing. So thus, while civility requires that I have good manners, that it recognizes that the others might not be so mannerly and that for good reason. The, the yelling might mean that people are used to not being heard. The civil person listens deeply and empathetically. By humility, I don't mean meek or even necessarily humble as it's usually used. Uh, I mean to always consider that we might be wrong, that our facts might be wrong, that our experience or knowledge is inadequate, that our perceptions of the other are wrong, even that our perceptions of ourselves might be wrong. Uh, you know, like 
what was this Facebook thing I, 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 I saw the other day that, you know, the, the, the problem with stupid is that stupid doesn't recognize itself. You know, <laughs> that. Uh, so that sometimes, you know, in fact, my shorthand for the, uh, maybe my version of humility, you know, the Adler uh, a phrase that I'm about acts so to the best in others and thereby in yourself, I would paraphrase that as, you know, don't be a jerk. But sometimes, you know, we don't realize when we're being jerks. Anyway, this means that much of what I'm talking about is not just about the other person, but about ourselves and our powers of observation, discernment, and compassion. And all of which I hope we will, you know, help each other acquire and develop. In fact, that's what we do when we get together like today, is we help each other. I love the thing, you know, Bart had us do our conversation. That is, uh, you know, for all I know, you may get more out of those little conversations that you had at the end of this day than you get from me up here talking to you. Uh, but whatever, that we're engaged in a community thing here. I know I got a good tale uh, uh, from our little small group conversation there about, you know, dealing with the permit department that I'm going to, to carry on. Um, we help each other develop. And while I think we must be firm in holding our values, I think we must be humble in our presentation of them. Ah, but now empathy. Empathy is, I think, the most difficult of these three things. So civility and humility and empathy. Feeling empathy for the downtrodden, the oppressed, the wronged, you know, that's easy. Feeling empathy for those whom we think are wrong, for those who seem to be, you know, opposed to good things and champion bad things. These are much, it's much, much harder to feel empathy toward this kind of person. I know it's hard for me, but it's something I think we have to do. The opposite of empathy is contempt. And that is far more easier to feel, and we see a lot of contempt in American society. In fact, let me quote here Arthur C. Brooks, who is president of the conservative think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, and thus in a lot of ways thinks very differently than I do on, on issues. But I really agree with him on this. He's the author of a book that was published a few years ago called Love Your Enemies, how decent people can save America from the culture of contempt. And Brooks says this, that our problems today are not incivility or intolerance, it is something worse, contempt, which is a noxious brew of anger and disgust. And not just contempt for people's ideas, but also for other people. Contempt makes persuasion impossible. No one has ever been hated into agreement, after all. So the expression is either petty self-indulgence or cheap virtue signaling, neither of which wins converts." Close quote. In fact, this statement by the conservative uh, Arthur C. Brooks reminds me of a similar statement by the radical A.J. Musty, one of my uh, troublesome heroes. Of, uh, he was a 20th century pacifist, labor organizer, uh, opposer of the Vietnam War, who I think expressed our task succinctly. Uh, Musty writes, one has to be both a resistor and a reconciler. You have to be sure that when you are reconciling, you're also resisting any, te any tendency to gloss things over. And when you're primarily resisting, you have to be careful not to hate, not to win victories over human beings. You want to change people, but you don't want to defeat them. You know, you may want to defeat their ideas, you may want to defeat their proposals, but you don't want to defeat them as people of worth in and of themselves. And to change people, to change people, you really have to see them and try to understand them. What you can't do 
is dismiss them. What you can't do is, 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 is to say, you know, you don't matter. That in our country that's divided in so many ways, it's so easy to dismiss people who are, you know, different in ways both fundamental and, 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 and inconsequential. You know, we categorize and organize and we, we, we put people down because they like different music than us or they, they shop in, in, you know, in, in, in different stores or they have less money than we do or they have you know, less education or, 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 or whatever. It's, it's just easy to put things down. And, and to put people things down means to ignore them, to not see them. Uh, Bart said this morning when he opened the meeting, it's you know, about seeing and hearing each other. Uh, another Brooks, this time it's the uh, New York Times columnist and writer David Brooks, uh, wrote this recently in the Atlantic Magazine. When you tell a large trunk, chunk of the country that their voices are not worth hearing, they are going to react badly. And they have. And he goes on to write, people who feel they have been rendered invisible will do anything to make themselves visible. People who feel humiliated will avenge their humiliation. Donald Trump, he goes on to write, didn't win in 2016 because he had a fantastic health care plan. He won because he made the white working class feel heard. Feel heard. Now certainly some of the people who are drawn to Trump were already racist and anti-immigrants and had a lot of bad ideas. And some had just felt ignored, lived in places that were ignored, felt put down, felt ignored by elites, which sometimes includes us, by the way, or people like us, you know. Uh, the uh, no, I'm not going to go into Trump. Sorry. Um, the, uh, I hope it becomes clear by now that my concern, and I think it's our concern of, of all of us here, should not only be about them, but also about us. Here we see truth in the acts so elicit the best in others and thereby in ourselves. I don't always know what I should do to bring out the best in others. But I do know behaviors that will bring out the worst in me. I, 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 I've, I've had a lot of examples of that, actually. And, and, and to bring out the best and not the worst in either myself or the others requires that I show respect for the other. And yes, I know sometimes that will be hard. These days, it seems we encounter a lot of folks who don't seem to exhibit worth and dignity and who probably don't think we do too. I know that everyone does not share in these values. Everyone is not interested in civil dialogue. I know, and I'll bet some of you know, people, people who even on our side, you know, and agree with us on issues, they're not interested in civil dialogue either. I mean, we have our own jerks. Uh, that, and you know, we won't reach everyone and we don't have to reach anyone, everyone, to affect significant change in our society. You know, in an evenly divided society, if you persuade 5%, 10% of folks to move over to, to you, if you find, you know, some of those folks who voted for Obama twice and then voted for Trump, these are folks that, you know, we've got to reach those folks. Now, I know some of the demographers say that that's not really what, exactly what happened, that the, those districts that voted for Obama, anyway, I'm not going to get into, you know, slicing and dicing here demography. But there are folks, and I'm sure you know a lot of them, that, you know, that are reachable. And some people, it's just that they're not reachable, it's just that people haven't tried to reach them. And we should be doing that. Um, that I don't, I think it's very wrong to conclude that anybody is beyond reach. But the good news, that this is not an impossible task. At least on a small level, 
there are examples of individuals engaging with the other and, engage, and changing the other. And here, let me give you just a couple of examples. First, from a 2017 National Public Radio story. A guy named Daryl Davis is an African-American blues musician. And he's what you might have, what you might call an interesting hobby. Over the last 30 years or so, Mr. Davis has made a point of hunting out Ku Klux Klan members and, yeah, and inviting them to have dinner with me, have lunch with me, it's on me, I'll pay, you know. And they've engaged in conversations. And he's converted some of them. He's got, he's changed them. He's got a closet full of Klan robes that these people have given him, you know. And an Elliot, well, that's right, we gave him the Elliot Black Award a few years ago. Uh, so, uh, and I have just recently discovered uh, a guy named Dylan Maron. And in fact, I, last night I, I shared with him his podcast with Ruth Ann and Bart. He's got, uh, he's got this podcast and he's just published a book that's called Conversations with People Who Hate Me. 12 things I learned from talking to internet strangers. And he has this, this active internet presence. I mean, he's a, he's a big podcaster and he he's broadcasts on Facebook and such. And as you can imagine, he has gotten this whole collection of really negative comments. You know, people have written him and you know called him, he's a gay guy too, and so he gets a lot of homophobic comments and, and, you know, people who write in, you know, the police can't be everywhere, and uh, when they're not around, you know, you're the first person we're going to come for. Uh, and, you know, your, 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 your podcasts are just ignorant expressions of opinion. So what he does is he calls up some of these people and he talks to them on the phone. And, uh, you know, those, those of you who are on Zoom, you know, Stay with me to the end of this, but, uh, but afterwards, you know, look him up when you get home. It's uh, Dylan, uh, M-A-R-R-O-N. Yeah, and I don't, I've watched a three minute one. I don't know how much fun it would be to watch 30 minutes. But the point is that it is possible to change ideas, that if you approach the conversations in the right, if you approach people in the right way, and in fact, one of Dylan's people says to him, you know, I didn't think you were going to talk to me. And, you know, I, I, still, I still think, you know, your ideas are wrong, but you listened to me. I appreciate that. I don't hate you anymore. <laughs> so aside from the gutsiness of these two men in the shows, what strikes me is that they treated people who hated them with respect. I think this doesn't mean that they you know, respected their ideas, but they have to treat the people with respect. And I think this is an important element of their success. It says, I see you, I hear you. Now, will you see and hear me? They might never have heard, you know, act to elicit the best in others, but I think they know what they're doing. And in so doing, I think they are eliciting the best in themselves and in the others. It's possible. So what I've been talking about this morning presents a particular challenge to, to those of us who, who base much of our worldview on the attribution of worth uh, to our fellow human beings and who recognize that how we treat others determines what kind of people we are. So I'm down to the end. And I'll leave you with just three, three concluding thoughts. Uh, and that's these. First, this can be hard, but you don't have to be a saint. You know, there's an out. I've said you've got to treat people with respect. You don't really have to respect the other. You just have to treat them with respect. You know, you don't have to feel it in your heart. You just have to show it in your face. You know, this is not hypocrisy. As long as the other person experiences 
the respect in your behavior. You're most of the way there. The behavior thing is the important thing. And if, I've heard it said that Nelson Mandela, as president of Union of South Africa, in private with his own staff, would, would mock his white supremacist uh, predecessor, P.W. Uh, Botha. The key thing, though, is in his public stature as leader and, and, in, uh, and for the peace of his country, he was respectable, respectful toward Botha in public. Yeah, with, you know, with outward practice, I believe we can develop inner respect, but we got to do the outward practice. You know, as the saying goes, fake it until you make it. Uh, secondly, I want to be really clear that none of what I'm talking about precludes being in the fray. That we must be open to the humanity of the other, but we must still work hard to promote our values in the public sphere. We must be out there, we can, you know, knocking on doors, uh, picketing, uh, going to demonstration, giving monies to candidates, <clears throat> turning out to school board meetings, making sure our friends turn out to school board meetings. We got to be out there. Uh, <clears throat> but here I agree with my, uh, with conservative author David French. We can recommit to our shared citizen and persevere uh, and preserve, rather, a space for all American voices, even as we compete against those voices in politics and in the marketplace of ideas. You know, we're out there competing, <clears throat> but we're respecting those that we compete with. <clears throat> and finally, this. Compared to some religions, ethical culture doesn't ask much from us. You know, we don't have special diets. We don't ask people to wear special clothing. Uh, we don't have fasting. Uh, we don't tell you, you know, who you should love, uh, who you should have sex with, or what you, how you should present yourself with your sexuality. But, you know, none of this. We were, you know, uh, <clears throat> had dinner last night at a fine Indian restaurant where the staff were, you know, Muslims, and they're serving food in the restaurant, but this is Ramadan and they're fasting. And you know, we don't have any of that in ethical culture. Nibble all you want in ethical culture. Now, if I had my way, we'd all be vegans, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but listen, but we, we, we don't have any of these rules, but we do say this. We do tell you, and it's not an easy thing, treat every person as a person of worth and dignity. That's not just an intellectual concept. It's a way of life. If we are serious about what we're doing, it's a rule. It's our commandment. And in fact, we have a simple 13-word rule to help us on that. Act so as to elicit the best in others and thereby in yourself. That is the way of respect. Respect is our pathway to becoming the kind of people in, uh, we want to be in the world we want to create. It's making a better place. It's practicing our religion. So let's go forth and shine our ethical culture. That's what we're all about. <clears throat>